Karen Beekbeek, Bunarong Nurmde Burupton Ata Willem. That means welcome to our beautiful home, the lands of the two great bays, Nurm, Port Phillip Bay, and Marin, Western Port Bay. We're here at the Monash University campus, and it is about celebrating knowledge, Yelenge. It's also about respect, respecting the country that you're now a part of. And it's also Jambana, how you will build a stronger community. How do we unite community within Monash University? And it's about respecting sacred ground or Papanata, Mother Earth. These are the guiding pillars of Warongi Bik, the law of the land. It's come with a purpose. Wamanjika, Marin Bik Bik, Bunarong, Namdep, Barapten, Ata, Willem, Nungujin. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for uh, our form and content conversation. My name is Hannah Matthews. I'm senior curator at the Monash University Museum of Art, MAMA, which is at Monash's Caulfield campus in Melbourne. Um, for those who are low-sided or blind and joining us for today's conversation, just a quick visual description. Um, I identify as female. I have long British brown hair, fair skin. I'm of Nordic Scottish uh, background, very tall, but sitting down in my lounge room here in Thornbury. Um, bright blue top on and actually large earrings today. Um, and before I go further, I would just like to acknowledge that I am uh, speaking and Zooming today from my home in Thornbury, which is on Wurundjeri country in Kulin Nation, southeast of uh, part of Australia. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of these lands and waterways, which I'm working from today and also acknowledge um, those emerging uh, leaders uh, in the cultural community. Now, today, Form and Content um, is a talks program that takes place throughout the teaching semester of Monash University. And a semester one uh, in 2021 has been focused on three key ideas of sustainability, collaboration, and particularly how First Nations are centering country within their practice. And it's my absolute um, delight and pleasure today to welcome Dale Harding, an artist from Brisbane, who is joining me for the last uh, form of content conversation for this semester. So welcome, Dale. Good morning, Hannah. Good morning. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and also share a visual description for our viewers? Sure. Uh, good morning, viewers. My name's Dale Harding. I'm currently in Brisbane. Uh, I'm aware that the Turrbal and Jagera communities, uh, their elders and their stories remain here in Brisbane as I'm an uninvited guest. I'm currently on the south side of the river, so I understand I'm on Jagera country here in my studio. Um, a quick visual description. I'm facing fairly, fairly easterly. Probably east is in, in this direction here. The sun's beaming on the wall in front of me. Uh, I'm quite tall uh, to the point where traveling on planes uh, causes me some challenge. Uh, I have long dark hair out today. My hair's out because we're doing a different work day. And the studio looks like I've just made a lot of work, uh, being that there's, there's a, uh, remnants of the work and, and the making process around. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dale. It's a real pleasure to have you here online for this talk or this conversation, really, because it really will be much more of a conversation rather than a presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so tomorrow you're actually arriving in Melbourne to begin installing an exhibition of yours, which is titled Through a Lens of Visitation, which is happening at MAMA. Yeah. And we have been using this format of Zoom pretty much for the last um, 12, 18 months, uh, discussing this exhibition and what you hoped it might achieve and constitute. Uh, so maybe we will just begin with that, Through a Lens of Visitation. What is the intent or the purpose or the aim for this project? for you personally? Yeah, uh, well, thanks, Hannah. I, uh, what's the point, what's the, the intent of the, of the work? Um, the overarching umbrella of my whole practice seeks to continue what my grandparents, my mother's parents had left us in their cultural inheritances and what we might choose to take forward with us into our futures. 
my cousins and I have made work together and my uncle Milton and my mother Kate and I have also made work where we've been asking questions over the years about what do we want to take forward with us, what's worth keeping and, and holding on to. So through a lens of visitation is another part of that process. Um, looking at, for me as a professional artist, um, the way art, Australian art histories uh, have had intersections with my mother's territories, but also what uh, is Kate doing in her practice and what are we doing and, and how do we have a, a current and living continuation of those cultural inheritances? It's a big question and a big answer, which is very much the way it should be. Um, I guess a little background, you know, when Mama approached you about working together on this exhibition, um, you know, from the museum's point of view, we had thought, oh, you know, Dale has had, um, you know, shown, had invitations to make projects in quite significant spaces in Australia and also overseas. And down here in um, Melbourne, you know, you've, you've presented work at Linden Contemporary, at Gertrude Contemporary and out at Tarawara um, Biennial. But we've only had the opportunity, most of us, to see sort of single standalone projects. And we thought for Mama it would be really great and welcomed to hand over the space to you to bring a number of works together in conversation with a new project. And that's kind of what we have developed uh, over the last sort of 12 to 18 months, kind of a show that is looking back at the last five years of practice, let's say. But okay. um, what I was really struck by and also enthused by when we started talking very early on was that you were very keen to uh, invite your mother, Kate Harding, who's a textile artist, to make a new body of work as part of the exhibition. And right. something that would be made in conversation with you as you also made a new body of work, which would sit alongside right. Kate's works and the existing works. So just, would you be happy to share a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of including Kate in this way, in this project? Because it's significant, obviously. Sure, it is. and. Um... And, you know, what Kate's been doing my whole life feeds in and out of my practice. Um, and so uh, I could suggest that initially some colleagues, and we maybe we'll touch, us, touch on this a little later, but some colleagues have given me some leads on the way that um, uh, Margaret Preston and then subsequently Sydney Nolan had visited Carnarvon Gorge. And they were leads that I was investigating and, and seeking and um, trying to make sense of what this could be. Uh, and eventually in my own work, I got to recognize that um, perhaps Kate in her pursuit of making, uh, making in the home, uh, she'd been making quilts since, since uh, 1982. And um, she'd been also in 2008, made some significant leaps in her practice as a, as a quilt maker and as a, as a textile artist. Uh, Kate made a, the leap into telling from American and, and, and European traditional uh, forms of, of quilt styles. Kate leapt into telling her father's story when he had finished up. In 2008, uh, mum made a, a, a memorial quilt for Brenda. And so that's a milestone there in Kate's practice, but that, was, uh, that stood out to me once I started to get into the, the idea that um, Australian modernisms were interconnected or, or there were the intersections with Carnarvon Gorge. And so Kate was already on a, on a strong run in her own practice. Uh, I've worked over the last couple of years to keep uh, my own research just to the side of Kate and not um, uh, burden her, you know, necessitate that in her space. But she's been on this huge run of, of making these, these um, leaps in her own quilt making process. And uh, it was easy to see that there's, a, there's an alignment, but also that the, uh, the, the things that I've been pursuing in my work also are reflected in what Kate's been making. Mm. I think, um, you know, so, um... Several weeks ago, I was able to come up to Brisbane and spend some time with you in the studio. And then a week or two ago, just for a day, I came up and we and Kate came down um, from Akai and um, we met at the Milani Gallery and unpacked all these quilts. Um, right. It was not just the three of us having a look at these. It was also really, you know, the community of makers around you and also around Kate that was present for that. Um, right experience of sharing and looking. So we unwrapped the quilts, which were, which have now been, you know, carried down to Melbourne. Um, but with us on that day was um, Jan Oliver. Yes. And Mandy Quadrio. Yes. Then later, Carol McGregor. And yes. I know they're three very important people for you and also Kate. Um, right. And I think as part of this project, you know, you really identified and made the opportunity through some support through Arts Queensland 
to really bring this community of people around yourself and Kate and to really focus on what Kate has been doing with her textile works, but also, right. you know, the languages, the lexicon of imagery that's used within, um, well, that's very specific to central Queensland and the cultural practices of central Queensland. Right. Can you share a little bit about that? Because it's so much at the heart, I think, of your interest in this exhibition. It's perhaps less tangible in the exhibition itself. It's all, they're all, these relationships are all held in Kate's quilts. Right. But I wonder if you might just share a little bit about who those women are, their significance to this project and the processes that kind of took place behind the scenes. Sure, yeah. Um, so I'll start with Jan Oliver. Uh, Jan was a, a tutor when I was an undergraduate student uh, for myself. It happens that also there's a, a few other artists who are now practicing, pra practicing on the national level that Jan was a tutor for. And we've, main, we've maintained a strong friendship. Jan has a uh, long history in making, but also in, in teaching and other uh, pursuits, but in, in making particularly in felt. So, uh, uh, and, uh, and textile and dyeing and pigmenting and these kinds of pursuits. Uh, Mandy Quadro is now a practicing artist and a doctoral candidate at the Queensland College of Art. And Mandy has her strong interest in telling her stories. And uh, Mandy's also had some time up in Mackay and Serena, so there are uh, social interconnections for Mandy and where mum and dad are living, Kate's living and working now on Yuiwara country in Mackay. And uh, Mandy has strong interest in telling uh, the truth of her uh, matrilineal stories and her own expression. And Carol McGregor is, is what I would consider one of the experts in possum skin cloaks. And certainly her art of the skins processes and her doctoral research is, uh, um, develop this great body of knowledge around the making of indigenous textiles really. And so when Kate had been um, initially using things like uh, Amish and, uh, and, and, and American sort of block geometric design quilts and finding ways to personalize those and finding ways to build upon them. Uh, and then eventually Kate started using indigenous licensed textiles and uh, making applique and cutting blocks out of the indigenous licensed textiles. Uh, and then in a pursuit towards get, getting closer and closer to telling her own story, because a lot of the, the textiles were of other different, um, uh, you know, parts of the country or other people's expression. Of course they were licensed and of course it's legit that Kate could use those in, in making work. Just seeking to always get closer and closer to telling her story. Um, Jan and Mandy were really key in supporting Kate in moving towards dyeing and pigmenting her own textiles. So Kate had moved from uh, printed licensed indigenous design, which she was reforming to tell her story, to now working with textiles that are pigmented from her mother's country. They're pigmented from, from Gungaloo and Garingal and Bidjara country, uh, the, 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 the fabrics that Kate's working with. And Carol's uh, uh, expertise in cloak making and in indigenous textiles meshes in really beautifully for the future where those, um, those new developments have come. So Jan and Mandy supported Kate in uh, yeah, furthering on the leaps and, and helping her to get to where she actually wanted to go, where she was driving to get to. And Jan and Mandy both have ex expertise in those areas to be in, in the studio with Kate and to be offering some professional, uh, um, what do we call it, mentorship. And we'll see where, where Carol and Kate might go in the future. It was very special to be there that day to see all the dynamics of those friendships at play because your mom was, Kate was very, um, you know, we started unwrapping the quilts and we began actually with the quilt that she made when you were born or maybe on your first <laughs> birthday, you know, like yeah. a tiny little quilt. Yes. And, um, and which was familiar, you know, like there was a lot of um, care and sentiment and you know marking of it an occasion you know but also comfort and kind of protection and then there was a quilt that she made somewhat later larger yeah. in body scale um and then you know yourself and Kate had made a selection of these quilts that she'd sort of been making more recently in conversation with yourself and, and Carol and um Jan and Mandy right. and you can definitely see I think the selection you've made really demonstrates this sort of um development or evolution as you say from these sort of western Amish Scandinavian sort of styles of quilt making through to I mean they're really I mean there's still sort of very strong geometric forms throughout them but they're really 
assertive and confident and quite declarative in their right. conditions. Like there's a real confidence that kind of emerges through them. And then the materials, you know, some, some quilts are scaled to a single or double bed, some are square and, you know, very sort of frontal, right. and pictorial in a way on the wall. Right. Um, but it, again, as you say, like, also the materials and types of materials and how they're placed in relationship to each other, but also how they're annotated through the application of, or I don't know all the techni technical kind of language, but you probably do, but like the additional kind of applique or pittery bags that have been added to them. There's also these other points of emphasis that Kate has really made almost yeah. on top of them, like this elaboration to the stories that they hold. Yeah. Um, I could tell while, and it, I mean, everyone was pouring over them. You know, not only like I was kind of looking and, and enjoying the sort of atmosphere of, of this energy of this warmth in the room, but Jan in particular was pouring over them with her fingers. You know, she was kind of reading them in this sort of quite um, right. up very close, you know, and obviously yeah. sort of stories have been shared in the making of, just even in the making of the quilts that alone the stories that your mum also brought, you know, to them. Right. Um, and I think as a body of work, that, that speaks a lot, not only to Kate's practice, but I think also, you know, two things that you talk about quite a bit, one being around kind of growing the literacy of the kind of visual lexicon that's specific to central Queensland. So yes. encouraging sharing with others so that they can also recognise these languages. Yes. And in a faraway place such as Melbourne, um, so beginning that kind of journey for the audience as we come and see those works. Um, <clears throat> but then second to that, which you described before in a very nice way, you were sort of talking about droughts and flooding. So both in a kind of what has been happening recently with the weather, but also this metaphorical way around, you right. know, holding space for cultural practice. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that in terms of Kate, but also yourself, this relationship to country and this notion of home. Sure, yeah. And um, of course, my preference was, would always be for Kate to be here to tell all of this entirely in her own. Uh, when I work with Hayley Upkirt and uh, Hayley Matthew and Jordan Upkirt and Milton Lawton and Will Lawton, it's always been their space to talk and to tell theirs. Of course, that's open to Kate, but she would prefer that, that we do our work, you know? So she's declined the invitation to tell the, the story this way. Um, well, say so Uncle Milton and, and uh, whose mum's younger brother and, and, and mum have been fortunate that their parents really worked and both in their own different cultures um, and they're both different language groups and different territories. They really worked to hold space through their entire lifetime. So that was an unbroken connection to country. Uh, they also worked very strongly to have an unbroken um, dialogue with national parks over the estates of their, their own territories. Uh, and they also worked living in diaspora uh, in, in Rockhampton, um, away from the places that they considered their spiritual and ancestral homes. Nana and Grenda had also really worked very prominently in the community to hold space for the visibility of their cultural forms and their, their identif self identifications, but always for other peoples as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Kate, you know, that's, that now comes by Uncle Milton and, and, and Kate, and uh, through to me and my practice. And so Uncle Milton has been holding the forms around um, carving and timber making, uh, timber selection, these kind of things, certainly around the, the knowledge and the skill in the seeking and preparation of ochres in relation to our inheritance in rock art tradition. Uncle Milton and his brothers have been holding that space and one of, one of our big uncles, granddad Fred Conway. Um, and also Kate has been holding that space in, in slightly different ways. Kate uh, is the oldest of the, of the family group so it has insight and knowledge and contact, uh, which is unique to hers. And she's been able to embed that and, and imbue that into her art forms. And so living away from home, uh, they've always been weaving back into the, the work that she's been doing. And um, in 2014, we had access to the South Australian Museum collection and the pictory bags that were held in there, which are in the Dutton collection. And Kate immediately saw those and she knew how to make them on the spot. She knew, that, knew how to make those pictory bags from a crochet paradigm. So she wasn't taught that as an ancestral form, but as soon as she, she interacted with it, she knew that it was a double treble knot and she knew how to make them. And she's made probably a couple of hundred since 
and refine that skill. And so Kate's been doing it that way, but also the quilts are now another way where she's been able to put the story. So there had been some interest in other younger females in the family network is that I want to make quilts and I want to tell our story because they've seen the way that Kate could uh, hold story in a, in, a, in a special textile, a memorial quilt for this kind of thing. Mm. So they're really there. And for me, the, the work that uh, we've been doing around the, the ochre work and the, um, the strong interaction with rock art inheritances has been around the visual literacy. Many of us, particularly my uncles, can identify sheerly, purely on colour, locate and tell the story on, on the basis of colour if it's in relation to something, uh, an art form in the, in the landscape. And Kate's able to do that around other ways as well now. And so the textile holds the colors and the, the locations and the, the stories and the inheritances in, in, uh, in geometric form. Yeah. So in terms of visual literacy, that's what we've been seeking to do. And many of my cousins and I can talk about a specific location just by a pure pigment and ochre. Uh, so some of the works in the show operate on pure pigment on, on the ochres. And we can talk about that exact location and any of the other different stories which we might attach to that one colour, which actually is the pigment and the location on the planet, which is in our grandparents' territories. So Kate's geometric quilts now have a similar one. So that's in the visual literacy, but also in relation to what might be Indigenous modernisms. Um, there are additional ways now that Kate, as a senior woman in our networks, might be able to share her story with younger females around her. The matrilineal um line lineage you know cultural heritage of your family is really key and it's something that's been identified and spoken about um you know considerably within your practice particularly more recently um you've spoken about kate and the community of makers around this newer project but there have been um others in your family that whose voice you have kind of brought forth into the practice. And I wondered if you might just take a moment to speak around Hayley Matthew, who you spoke, spoke referred yeah. to before, your cousin, um, yeah. because you worked together on quite a substantial piece called Private Painting Brackets H1, um, you know, work for the Shaja, uh, commissioned the Shaja um, Foundation. That's the one. It's a little bit of a different, um, story than perhaps Kate, who's always been making, you know, with her hands, whether it be, you know, all, all, all sort of types of textile practices. Haley, as I understand, was a sort of slightly different situation, actually stepping forward to sort of be welcomed into that space that you are in as both a cultural person and as a contemporary artist. Right. Would you be happy to share a little bit about um, that experience of working together? Sure, yeah. Um, so Haley Matthew, uh, her mother is uh, Kate's younger sister. So Auntie Karen Lawton was a senior ranger in the Indigenous identified role at Carnarvon National Park for close to 10 years. It was just about over nine years, holding that role as a senior uh, Indigenous identified ranger. So that's Haley's mum. Uh, and, you know, Haley comes from a, again, Hales is very clear that this is part of what the process is and that her voice is on the record. And also she gives you know, permission that I, share on her behalf as well. Um, Haley's family are very strong in dance as well. They uh, have a Torres Strait dance troupe in her married family. And so they're, they're physically uh, performative and, and culturally physically um, uh, present. And when we were making lots of work in the art practice, Haley was clear in saying, I wanna be involved. Uh, how can I join in? And so we developed a work for Ryan and Yui for the, uh, the Sharjah Art Foundation for a show called Surface Tension in 2019, um, which was seeking to have ways. I'd learned enough through making the works in situ as site-specific wall paintings with other family members. I'd learned that now we were ready for uh, there to be a, another device and um, particularly looking at veiling and the, the way for Haley to come and to have a number of days in the process of making her, uh, I think she had four, four and a half days making her work. And then we developed this idea of veiling the work or obliterating it. So it's both. We were veiling the work, but also obliterating the, the, the act of cultural performance. And so uh, Haley and I covered over her work, not unlike dot painting, the, the, the veils and the, and the shimmering of dots, which have been applied to contemporary art forms based in Central and other parts of Australia for many decades. So we were seeking to 
close off that process and also afford Haley the opportunity for her to choose what was disclosed and for her to choose who and how she told the story of that work. And then I got to also consider it through other international paradigms around uh, the performative object, the spent, you know, sort of found object, this kind of thing, uh, around the, the frame, the idea of the frame and the, and the negative stencil as well. So Haley had her opportunities to do her work and was also, uh, you know, we, we shared this, the, the process of making the other the painting. So it's across a multiple panels and Haley, uh, Maybe I'll leave it there, but it's across multiple panels and it's now all coming back together to be shown for through a lens of visitation. It's, um, I guess I, I sort of uh, encourage you to sort of speak to that experience because it um, sort of highlights two, two points um, that I think are quite specific, strong within your practice. And one is um, what is very potent about the practice, particularly is this, um, conf not conflating, but the bringing together of um, practices, visual the visuality of um, and story of cultural practice alongside sort of studio practice, and making holding that space, but making space for others within that. So. Um, you know, you've used this term generative practices before. We've spoken about that before. I, as I've described it as kind of, you know, it's a sort of type of relationality where you are here and you are kind of vibrating and sort of sharing. And it's almost like it's contagious, but sort of sharing out these opportunities that are extended to you as a contemporary artist with others in your family to grow the practice right. and the visual, you know, the visibility of these things. And Haley being one example, and also obviously Kate Harding being being another, and others that you've worked with in your family. But I think, um, you know, in the, in the contemporary art context, it's incredibly potent because it means, I guess, for the audience that you are sharing something in terms of your country, your culture, and the absolute. Um, fundamental importance of those stories and that the continuation, the continuum of those cultural practices. Um, you're sharing that, but you are also doing it through a frame of contemporary art theory, of contemporary art history. You know, it's like a, this is a sort of crude example, but it's a very tall sandwich with so much in it, things that people can recognise, people th things that people can't recognise. There is a very a uh, deliberate and responsible and considered way of what to share and what not to share. But it's very, it's generous on both parts. It's sort of giving people what they might already recognise from their experiences of art, but it's also sharing with them things that they may not have had contact or um, engagement with in terms of the cultural practices that are specific to your family and its, and its um, traditions and heritages. Right. And I think I've heard you describe yourself actually as an art nerd. <laughs> yeah. Art nerd, you know, the art nerd that kind of goes over here into art history, but yes. then also very much the cultural person who is a leader in their community, who holds a lot of stories and a lot of knowledges. Um, I think you, it sounds to me in our conversations that you often take a lot of joy in this kind of space of nerding out and bringing that you know, back onto country in some ways. Yes. Um, sorry, that's a very long way of kind of describing what I think is, in, is incredibly potent um, about your practice. But, you know, maybe could you talk perhaps within this kind of frame or within this kind of bringing together of these two worlds, um, perhaps through your choice of materials, how that plays out, perhaps through one or two examples that are in the exhibition through a lens of visitation. Yeah, sure. And make those points. Okay. Um, well, I might start by saying it's, it's been said a few times in conversation and sort of playfully that I'm the only artist in my family. And that's not true. And I always challenge that at the moment, particularly when someone is a fine maker or even a poet and they're saying that, that I'm the only artist in the family. That's not true. Um, because material process and material selection has been around me my entire life 
by all of the different generations who've maintained that cultural knowledge and just lived with it. Maybe we're re have recently having a, an exhibition practice or another time in exhibiting those, those skills, but it has been around the whole time I've been here. So in that sense, uh, I learned a lot about uh, botanical resins and gums and the difference between a resin and a gum and a sap and these kinds of things. And one of the ones I've been using quite a bit is uh, xantheria resin um, or grass tree resin. Um, and so there's a big story around that, that plant and its whole life cycle and, uh, uh, and, and the resin is actually part of that as well. And Uncle Milton and his uncle, uh, uh, his grandfather to me, uh, Stephen Kemp in Warabinda, uh, have both innovated ways to collect and to also use the, the resins. And so through their knowledges, I've been able to apply the, the uh, botanical xanthoria resin to glass works as a way to be metonymically or, or um, materially signifying cultural knowledges. But also I do get to play and enjoy the process of being in dialogue, deliberate, um, not dependent on, but certainly deliberate dialogue with uh, international art history, particularly modernisms and conceptual and minimal practices. So spraying or applying xantheria resin to uh, planks of glass, it's probably easy to call them a plank of glass, um, uh, has been really enjoyable because it links in with the works of um, like Dan Flavin, but also the coloured light of Peter Kennedy in Australian art histories. Um, and also why can't we have reverence um, derived from the botanical and, and, and cultural knowledges in our spaces? Why do they have to be churches and, uh, and, and other places? Why can't we develop out these, these knowledges that are present among us and, and imbue them into the home and the, the built environment? So I've been making these glass works for a few years now uh, using xantheria resin on glass and that's been really enjoyable. Um, and another would be, I guess, the, the pigments and the um, the choice of colors and the choice of pigments. There's a number of instances with works where the specific color of a pigment is deliberate in that, again, it's a location, but also there's the other ways that the, the choice of color as a material might be, might be relevant. It, uh, a certain color might be representative of a, of a certain ancestor, actually, this kind of one. That's enough there, but what I've really been enjoying also is a recognition in my work as I've moved around um, the world the last few years that I've been told by others that um, spraying ochre and particularly spraying negatives uh, stencils is their culture as well. So these have been um, humbling but also great learning experiences for me to, to recognize that ochre and pigment is a really shared process and there's lots of conversation that I've been involved in. So it's been enjoyable to play among be an art nerd again and to, to assert that I've got one of the works there titled um, Emetic Painting, uh, International Rock Art Red. And I, I claim, I make an assertion that International Rock Art Red is the hematite or the red oxide, which is the basis of rock art across the planet. And it's shared across many cultures and a number of different people I've met have known hematite and, uh, and, and International Rock Art Red in their own ways, which is so similar to the ways that uh, my family's kept that alive for us. So. Also looking with a clear reference to um, you know, modernist practices with Eves Klein and the, the innovation in seeking a specific blue and, and trademarking that blue to be international Klein blue. I'd like to put forward for a discussion this idea of international rock art red in that this is an international standard that predates all Western uh, art histories and practices and is actually shared in such a way that uh, it's, it's quite unifying. So, we can talk about ochre, but then I can purchase, you know, beautiful refined hematite and use it in the practice to speak to all the different art histories, including central Queensland, uh, including the other indigenous practices that I've had contact with, and then bringing in uh, international modernisms and post, of course, and post everything post. But yeah, yeah. I, I was listening to an interview that you uh, undertook with Angela Goddard at Griffith University um, right. about one of the panels from private painting that is held in that collection also. And I think she refers to it as, um, I wrote it down as like, um, uh, where did I do that? Like transnational material realization. Well, 
Yes, it's a big term. Do you know where that came from? Because it just it just describes very much actually what you just sort of spoke about in terms of, you know, pigment, the specific type of pigment and its international residences, not only just geographically, but also across time. Okay. Um, I can't recall at the moment a specific context for Angela's use of language there. And, and also Angela's been very close to my work uh, in, you know, dialogue over the years uh, we've had good conversations but I don't have a specific reference for transnational material realization mm -hmm. but certainly yeah the, the work I made for Leon Biennale which is uh, pigment on glass which will do a similar uh, work for MoMA uh, that is, is precisely that uh, transnational material realization that um, the gum arabic in that work and uh, the earth pigments are all familiar and, and, uh, and uh, what do we call it, accessible in many different places, yeah. I wanted to talk about one other work uh, in the exhibition, which is a recent, actually quite a recent kind of space that you've moved into, and that is the um, felts. Yes. Um, because, you know, I've heard with your earlier work and, and conversation of writing around the earlier work, um, there is, you know, much discussion around registers of the body. So how, right. the, how the sort of index of the body makes tangible the presence of yourself and family yep. and others. Right. Um, and, you know, most explicitly, perhaps that's through the stencil works on walls. But I also feel very much throughout the exhibition that, the pres you know, the body is very present, whether that be almost through the self portraits that you approach through these lengths or planks of glass, Yep. or through Kate's works, the kind of relationship to a single or double kind of body bed. Um, and the felts are also in this space as well. I wondered if you would be happy just to share a little bit about these works and how they've emerged, because it is a, it's a newer kind of space in which you are working and thinking. Groovy, yeah. Um, and I'm glad you, picked, you, you, you went to Kate's, the register of the body and the, and, uh, it's, it's um, presence in Kate's work, and also certainly that's been involved in the, the wall paintings and, the, and the, the stencil work we've been doing. Also, Nancy Underhill for the publication uh, goes into that territory as well around uh, the register of the body in contemporary in, in contemporary art in relation to Sydney Nolan. Mm -hmm. um, but the felts have kicked in when you know I, I've had a, a long involvement with textile work. I've had a strong interest in. Uh, in the, in the fall and drape of textile and Jan Oliver actually nudged me along when um, making up, making use of some of her, her leftover materials. Jan made a big felt, which is about, um, about 160 by 120 centimeter long, uh, three, three layer felt. So Jan made that as a, as a way to enjoy her love for felt making and to use up some of her materials. And Jan offered it to me as a gift to nudge along a bit of a, a, a kernel of work which was waiting to be realized and so I was able to bring in Jan's felt as a ready-made into my practice um, and I took that initial felt with me last year out bush a lot onto granddad's country um, and it was necessary actually because it was minus six on one night and a few nights of minus four uh, and and essentially camping in um, unsealed timber dwellings out there so that was really it was it was helpful. It was relevant as I felt on that country again, and to be to be interacting with animal um, textile on that country. Uh, so I made a composition um, marked into the surface of that felt and brought it back to the studio. And then there, Jan and I made the next felt together. In Jan transferring her knowledge of felt making to me, so I can do that for myself. And then the, the next one on was uh, was built. So I've now made three felts. Uh, with, a, with a long interest to see how many more I can make. And um, of course, felt in that context, being out on that country has a relationship to, again, cloaks. Uh, there's a particular possum which was heavily exploited on that country um, for its superb belts, uh, uh, pelts, sorry, pelts. It had a kind of bluish tinge to it as a, as a brush tail possum, and it was exploited very heavily. Uh, and also so were koalas, which is really, both of them are really challenging to see some of the images. I saw an image in a document with 3,000 koala pelts piled up. 
for sale towards uh, towards Europe uh, in in the in the in the nineteenth and twentieth century. So that country was a heavily you know enormously abundant, and also the ancest the animals were exploited to the point of um, of, of uh, depleted populations. So the pelts and the felts are really relevant to me there. The textile and the and the, the you know the, the use of the, the, the felts is really relevant around Kate's making of quilts, and I also really like the idea of them being a, a living, functioning object. Um, a lot of the different uh, revival practices over the last few years have seen uh, ancestral forms come back into the gallery and be considered and and received as 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 art beyond craft and beyond the positionality of of, of craft making to, to be considered as form and. And, and contemporary high art, but also they should be often them that, that forms should be lived with and interacted with and uh, and used. And so I'd love to be making as many felts as I can, but also seeing them used and lived on and lived among uh, when they're necessary out west. So of course, then we can draw in other conversations around where felt has been in in the last couple, you know, last hundred years or so in, in contemporary art making. Yeah. Well, I guess we've had conversations around Joseph Boyce and the felts that he used in his work after being saved, really, by a community of people during the Crimean War, I believe it was, when he was, you know, his wounds were kind of dealt with um, uh, either honey or wax and then wrapped with felt. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the other direction is also Carol McGregor, who who you mentioned before and who's just had an exhibition with Judy Watson at Artspace where Carol has shown a really ambitious and extraordinary possum skin cloak that she's been working on with community in Sydney. Right. Um, and Carol will open the exhibition and that idea of bringing her into this conversation to kind of make, reflect on these connections across these practices um, and again, right. the cultural histories and locations of them. Um, has felt important to do that and, and great that she's able to come down next week and do that um, with us all. Um, I'm conscious of time. There's lots to talk about. There's always lots to talk about, um, but I did want to make sure that we spoke about the book that you that you mentioned before, because, um, yes. you know, Mama has a real commitment to publishing around artists' practices and stories. And when we started speaking about this project, there were many ways we could have approached publication, but again, you, you had a very um, specific desire to realize a book that was about particular places and histories. And, you know, you had a hypothesis that you wanted to center in the book and then invite senior women scholars to kind of bring their knowledges and experiences and in sometimes actually like revisiting um, histories that they have written about. Right. Are you happy just to talk about, in the first instance, um, well, actually, no, however you wish to approach it. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Um, well, yeah, so my own, my own research since 2017 kicked off when um, Paula Dredge at the Art Gallery of New South Wales made me aware of uh, Sidney Nolan's photographs of his time in Carnarvon Gorge. So that's when the work, <coughs> excuse me, took a new, a new route. And from then there, it started unfolding that uh, Margaret Preston also was uh, there before Sydney Nolan. So looking towards a publication, um, it's a natural form for me to, to look towards the, the elders in that space, really. And, and I hope that's okay to say, but uh, uh, Nancy Underhill being a scholar on Sydney Nolan and Deborah, Deborah Edwards being a scholar on Margaret Preston's legacies, both uh, senior curators and writers, we approached them and, and uh, very, uh, very generously agreed to write new work, and write new essays, and, and look at Deborah Edwards has looked at uh, Margaret Preston's legacies, uh, Gordon Bennett's um, interaction, certainly in that space, but also how Kate's work uh, fits among those those same histories. And Nancy Underhill has has um, given us an insight to Sidney Nolan's trajectory, his, his history, as to how he got to Carnarvon Gorge and, and post uh, his visit to the Gorge. And Nancy also draws out some propositions that she can um, see in the legacy of his work. Um, and then also Anne Stephen being the scholar, you know, a, a senior art historian and scholar on um, Australian uh, conceptualisms and uh, minimalist practice through to contemporary, contemporary art. Um, 
Anne was also really key in uh, the thinking around the work in that I interact very often and quite um, uh, enjoyably with modernist and minimal practices. And uh, conceptualism is not too far detached from what is still lived and known in indigenous practices. And so Anne uh, was, was invited to, to contribute and has written a beautiful essay um, in seeing how some of the work we've been doing fits with uh, the other histories here in Australia. And what's also really cr crucial is that in the beginning of the publication, uh, a countrywoman and uh, an inter interconnected community member uh, to, to Kate and I, uh, Auntie Jackie Huggins, Dr. Huggins, has um, agreed to republish uh, an essay that she wrote in 1995 and also has written a, a, a new foreword for that, that same publication. In Auntie Jackie has been in leadership there looking at her mother's born country where her mother was born inside Carnarvon Gorge and Auntie Jackie's ongoing unbroken connection to the same, the same country. Uh, and Auntie Jackie looking at Carnarvon Gorge through the lenses of visitation and cultural heritage management and national parks and, um, and government jurisdiction, this kind of thing. So um, it's really, it's an honor for me, but also very important that Aunty Jackie leads that publication um, with her perspectives on the same histories and the same experiences that Kate and I have. And, and in fact, uh, Aunty Jackie has been in those conversations for a number of decades and the conversations don't change very much. So the title of the show, Through All Ends of Visitation, um, is born of a reality also that uh, Aboriginal management of cultural landscapes and the national parks estates around the Carnarvon estates. Uh, Auntie Jackie's been aware that these conversations have been ongoing around uh, good and proper management of those sites and, um, and the reverence for what they might be and we agreed on the weekend speaking that the conversation hasn't shifted very much from when her big uncle and my grandparents were sitting side by side doing the same work. Now in my generation, the conversation is still quite similar. So my, um, my recognition goes to Aunty Jackie and all those, those who've been doing the work uh, in, uh, in, in the visitation and, and the, um, the, the management of what is more than a tourist part, yeah. It's um I can I can hear the weight of um yeah frustration and disappointment that things have not changed. Um, I only hope that they they do. Um, and you know perhaps in the interim, what you're doing, what Kate's doing, what you know you not being the only artist in the family, you know all the community right. makers around you. Um, you've described as, you know, constructive modes of resistance, you know, so right. holding this space, continuing in this space while the rest of the world catches up with really how things, you know, have been and should be again. Um, it's a pity Auntie Jackie can't visit uh, Melbourne in the show, but because I was very looking forward to meeting her, um, incredibly um, knowledgeable, strident, uh, powerful person. Um, uh, but no doubt she would be incredibly proud, Dale, because the exhibition, you know, and just in this format of the exhibition and the book is doing is doing a lot. And I hope people are really cognizant of that when they're in, in the space. It's important. And I think, you know, particularly around the show, maybe this is also part of the thing of um, the approach to the show is hopefully in putting things, different works in conversation with each other people realize um, not only the continuum, but you know, the pathway through your own practice and through your practice into family and on, onto country and um, observe the longevity of that. And, and um, you know, through being there, through experiencing and looking and listening, um, commit to valuing and prioritizing and coming to understand better the significance of that, at that history and, and that relationship. To right. Um, Hannah, might I just quickly yes. point to it also? So, in looking at uh, eldership and, and leadership, uh, seniority and, and uh, expertise in the fields, um, we also close off the publication with uh, the report made by Professor Paul, uh, Paul uh, Professor Paul Tayson, uh, who's here in the Griffith University uh, Rock Art Institute, 
Um, and uh, Paul was invited by a select group of people to make a, um, people who are present in, in caring for Carnarvon after the devastating fires of 2018. And I'll leave that there because Paul has written a report outlining uh, the community experience and the reality of that uh, loss of a site there. And that's, that follows up, that sort of closes off the publication. Uh, Aunty Jack begins it, we get into our work and our conversation and Paul uh, Taysom's uh, report ends the publication in a, rea in a reality which we're still uh, um, looking at as a community. Mm. So, uh, mm. Important to include and you know I would like to acknowledge that um, you know through the duration of working on the show and, and being introduced to different voices within your practice and adjacent to your practice you know everything is done with a purpose and intent um, and considered uh, the context that they will be taking place in. Um, and between the exhibition and between the publication, because it is a publication, it's not a documentation of right. it's not an exhibition catalogue, it it's quite a substantial um, statement around uh, the Carnarvon Gorge and the areas around it. It's an important statement about the significance of that country and also, um, you know, those elements that have jeopardised that country yeah. and the problems, you know, problems that are continuing to exist around accessibility and the health of that country. It's also very purposely a reflection on that country and how it has resonated beyond the geography of that place into Australian art history, specifically right. early modernism through Margaret Preston and then sort of mid modernism through Sydney Nolan and then your own practice, if we're thinking about it in terms of late modernism and, and minimalism and conceptualism, as you stated before. So it's doing like through a lens of visitation is doing a lot um, in, in, in playful ways, art nerdy ways, but then right. also in very significant um, cultural ways, which yourself and Kate have our best place to speak about and you have spoken about today. Um, we're incredibly grateful um, to you and your family for um, working with Mama to host the project in all its multiple components. Um, we're really looking forward to installing the show with you this coming week and also then welcoming Kate on the weekend and getting into that space together. Um, thank you kindly. Um, is there anything else you would like to say or speak to before we wrap up until tomorrow? <laughs> um, my, my gratitude to uh, yourself and, and Charlotte Day and, and the Monash University Museum of Art and also certainly to the leadership the First Nations leadership that you have uh, around you there at Monash and also the, the communities of makers who also have uh, been open to some contact. I'll, I'll look forward to, to connecting further when I'm down in, in, in Melbourne on um, Narum. Yeah.